Good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2022. I've received apologies from Maurice Golden, MSP. Uh, our first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. Are members content to take agenda item four in private? Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is to begin to take evidence as part of a pre-budget scrutiny on, cultures, on the culture spending portfolio. Can I welcome to the committee this morning, Jim Hollington, Chief Executive of Dance Space, David Avery, Nego Negotiation Officer for Prospect, Kirsty Cumming, Chief Executive Community Leisure UK, Julia Armour, Director of Festivals Edinburgh, Janet Archer, Chief Executive of Edinburgh Printmakers, who is attending on behalf of Scotland's workshops. Uh, and if I could start with a question on the cost of living crisis. Um, obviously, we've received a great deal of evidence that has highlighted significant concerns about increased operating costs facing cultural organisations. And it would be useful to hear um, what impact that had ha has had on, on your own um, relative areas of interest. So if I could maybe start with um, asking what the Scottish Government can do in its budget to support the culture sector in this cost of living crisis and if you can invite Mr Hollington to start please. Sure, uh, thank you and uh, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, as I mentioned in the evidence, I mean it's been it's had a pretty serious effect uh, on us along with many other organisations and I think I should preface preface this by saying, you know, we're not arguing that we're, we're different to others. In fact, that this, this crisis is so universal that I think we're reflecting things that many, many different organisations are feeling. Um, I think that the situation for organisations like ours is, is almost a perfect storm in many ways of uh, rapidly and unexpectedly increased costs and reduced income. So if we look at the cost side of things, obviously, Again, things have moved on and they're moving on literally every day at the moment but you know uh, the energy crisis it in, increase for the organization so we come out of our energy fix at the end of january again it's obviously different organizations have different deals with their energy providers um, after yesterday's announcement it actually seems that the announcement is not quite as good as it may have may have uh, as it may have seemed in that the rates that are being talked about are the wholesale rates and still your supplier will be able to add extra costs on top of that so i think that we're still looking at an energy price increase from about 35,000 a year to probably 90 or 100,000 a year um, it's better than the 160,000 a year which we were looking at without any support so absolutely that is a big difference but if you add that to, let's say, a 9 10% increase in salaries and other bills, that's about 150,000 of unexpected and unplanned costs rapidly coming in uh, for an organization that has about a 1.2 million turnover. Of course, if you look on the income side of things, there are, there are also real pressures there. So for dance base, a large part of our income, so you know, our income is three, it's largely three areas. Our income is core funding, about one third, um, it's clear, in fact, Creative Scotland are clear, who are our major core funder, that that core funding for next year will be at current levels. Well, a process has gone through for what happens in 2024. City of Edinburgh, similarly, has committed to the same level, but not, not more than that next year. Um, in addition to core funding, the, sec the second part of, uh, of our financial model, again, about a third, is dance classes and performances. Um, these are... Uh, not people's core spending. Um, we did put our, our prices up quite substantially after COVID to reflect increased costs. Realistically, it's pretty difficult in a market where people's um, expenditure and people uh, discretionary spending is really under pressure to imagine that that market is going to be performing particularly well over the next few months. And we, along with other cultural organizations who, who run performances, we've seen about a 20% decline on our targets. Uh, for audiences to the dance participants to dance classes but most cultural organizations I think are looking at similar numbers for, for, for paid activity the third area is all kinds of fundraising whether that's trusts and foundations uh, whether that's individual giving um, or whether that's project work and again of course it's an area that we are pursuing but it's an area that is being very very actively pursued by many people at the moment you've also seen many funders including uh, including trusts and foundations during the COVID period, very much switched their funding to, 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 uh, to short-term emergency rather than, rather than longer-term funding. 
So I think if we go to the question of what, what can government do, so I think there are perhaps two, well, two or three things. I think one thing is to acknowledge that there, has, there, there is a longer term issue underneath this, I think. That there is, on the one hand, a really, uh, you know, one of the reasons I moved to Scotland is, you know, after having worked for the British Council in countries around the world, is because Scotland is seen and the commitment from, from government is really clear uh, for the role that culture has to play in this country, not just, uh, not just culture's intrinsic role, but also how culture can help people live healthy and happy lives. But there is a mismatch between that really clear commitment and the way that culture has been supported over the last decade or so. So the reality is that funding hasn't, hasn't followed that. And in fact, again, along with most uh, cultural institutions, our level of core funding from, Gov from Creative Scotland has been static uh, for 11 years now. Obviously, in real terms, that's pretty tough. So I think a, a realisation or a commitment to say that if, if we believe in the value of culture, then also needs to be an understanding that, firstly, we need, we need to fund that sector properly, or if we have an envelope that can't be expanded, we need to understand that we might need to be a bit more, uh, uh, we might need to have ambition, of slightly fewer ambitions that we have currently in order to make sure that we have a sector that works properly. Uh, I think the second one, and this is again a lot, of, a lot of the evidence has been about this, is actually how we support arts and culture to deliver health and wellbeing benefits for people. There's been an enormous amount of evidence and an enormous amount of discussion about how arts and cultural interventions at an early stage are really effective, not just in preventing, but also actually in taking people out of medicalized environments after they've, uh, after they've had treatment. But the reality is, I think that both sides of the equation are looking to the other for funding. So the cultural sector seeing health and social, social care funding as being potential support for doing more meaningful work. Health and social care is saying, this is a way of relieving some of our budgets, that without an India, there are a lot of really positive words, but I think we feel we've yet to see a way of both, both health and social care and the cultural sector working together to be able to access support. Thank you. Um, could I invite Janet Archer? Thank, thank you. you, convener, and um, thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, I, I want to start just by name-checking the other Scotland's workshops, if I may, very briefly. So Peacock Visual Arts, Edinburgh Sculpture Workshop, Scottish Sculpture Workshop in Lumsden, Aberdeenshire, Glasgow Sculpture Studios, and then there's us, there's Glasgow Print Studios, Stills in Edinburgh Street Level, Photoworks in Glasgow, Highland Print Studio in Inverness, Dundee, Contemporary Arts in Dundee, and uh, Northland Creative, which is in Caithness. And just for your reference, Edinburgh Printmakers now works in meanwhile spaces in Aberdeen, Lanarkshire, Dumfries, Livingston, Grangemouth, Kilmarnock, Falkirk, Paisley, uh, Fife, and we're looking at Glasgow. So we're a very um, strong network of organisations which provide cultural services across the country. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the committee and the Scottish Government for the support that you have given us over this last period, which has been tremendous um, and very welcome, um, and I think underpinning our survival at the moment because things are tough. Um, so I, I think there are lots of ideas in the papers um, that you have had for this meeting. Um, the things that sprung to mind in terms of things to really look at are um, the tourist levy, um, which I think Wales is now piloting. Um, and I think it is definitely something that Scotland should look at um, and pilot if it can. Uh, I think percent for art um, on development, certain blueprint makers, uh, as some of you may know, is based in Fountain Bridge. In, we're an island at the moment in the middle of a wasteland which is being developed into a new community for the city. Um, and if we had benefited from that development in some which way, um, more than the sponsorship which the developers have offered us privately, uh, I think that would have helped hugely over this, this period. And then my third point um, relates um, to the idea of whole systems approach um, and what does that really mean. Uh, and I think the papers of all of the, 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 the submissions have said that it's really complex to 
try to get different bits of government to work together, particularly in a competitive environment where everybody's trying to defend their own case. However, I would say within culture, there is a system at present where some bits of the money come directly from government, some bits come through Creative Scotland, other bits come through local authorities. And at least if a whole system approach that established a sort of matrix that looked at the cultural provision um, across um, local areas across the country on a regular basis um, and took um, headline themes like uh, quality of work or quality of engagement or reach um, or even need um, looking at accounts in relation to where individual organisations are then perhaps you might get to a better place in relation to utilising the money as it stands. So those would be my points. Um, Thank you say. very much. Um, and uh, you mentioned, um, can I just say a thank you for all of the written submissions to the, the committee, they were very, very helpful. Um, I could invite David Avery next, please. Thanks. Yes, and uh, also my thanks for inviting us to this committee. Um, the prospect members work in a range of areas in culture, so I think it would be fair to say our experience of our members in the theatre and performing, uh, supporting se sectors in Beck to experience mirrors what Jim has said and has described. If I can focus more on the areas which are directly funded by government, the national collections, as I think they're probably not going to be covered elsewhere. Um, they're having a particularly difficult issue with their budgets at the moment. The budget set, grant and aid fixed for the next year. At the same time, we have pressures around changing pay policy, changing costs around uh, the utility bills, um, and trying to square that circle with government of the cost, your budget income is fixed, your ability to fundraise is very limited because you're a government body. With under, under significant restrictions, um, ministers are understandably not wanting to reduce service levels. Squaring that against those increasing costs and indeed uh, pressures around uh, fair work, around delivering a 35-hour week, around delivering a fair pay rise, even something even close to inflation. Uh, those pay talks are still ongoing. Um, that is becoming more and more difficult, and not just for this year, but in future years. Um, these are organisations which, as well as being public bodies, are charities and have legal duties upon their boards not to sign off to costs they cannot afford in future years. Um, and, you know, without some certainty about what the funding will look like in future years, it's very difficult for them to make decisions around cost of living, around fair work and so on, um, without imperiling staff numbers or delivery. Uh, and I think it's an ongoing discussion. but. There absolutely needs to be look at, a, a look at how these organisations uh, deliver that work, how they are able to plan for the future, um, and either be given more freedom to be able to do fundraising, to be able to act as so, in some ways like the museums and galleries and so on in England do under the museum freedoms, or to be treated more as a public body and then be given greater funding, funded at a higher level than they currently are and then allow uh, to, so they can react to changes such as this. Uh, I mean, they're not allowed to keep reserves year to year, as an example, which would be very different to the experience of our members working in the charitable sector. Um, within that charitable sector, within that natural heritage sector, we're seeing real challenges around pay, real challenges around uh, utilities, real challenges around costs. And you know, if I take the National Trust for Scotland as one of the examples, an organisation which lost a lot of staff over, over the pandemic, this was widely reported, is still coming out of that, still uh, struggling with staff numbers, um, and has now had these very large unexpected costs and has the similar concerns Jim has raised about fundraising. It is, they've had a very successful fundraising campaign during the pandemic around uh, Save Our Scotland. They're now concerned about, quite rightly, about whether or not similar fundraising campaigns will be so, as successful with the freeze on, uh, squeeze on household budgets. Um, I think the final point I would make about this is that the pay, pay within the sector has never been great. It's an area to which our members work in because it's a vocation. It's in many cases, it's their life's ambition to work with these collections. And what members are saying to us now is it is becoming harder and harder to do it. It is becoming harder and harder to be able to afford to do the thing you want to do, the thing you love to do, when salaries are getting worse and worse and costs are going up and up. And I absolutely understand why these organisations, the positions these organisations are in. 
they can't afford inflationary pay rises because their budgets simply don't afford it. But how many years is that going to continue before people say they simply can't afford to work in the sector? Thank you. Could I invite Kirsty Cumming, please? Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to be here this morning. I think a lot of the, the points that um, the previous speakers have made probably echo very closely um, you know, our perspective and the perspective of our, our members across Scotland. But I guess just to, to highlight a couple of areas, one is obviously the utilities um, and operating costs, which for our members have just soared you know, beyond any previously expected levels, um, as is the case across you know, a number of sectors. We're very aware of that. But really, for our members, you know, they're all charities, they're all delivering public services. Throughout the pandemic, a lot of the reserves that they had were used in order to stay um, solvent. There was very limited support um, for leisure and culture trusts throughout the pandemic, other than local authority support, which I would say was, was excellent, and those re relationships were very, very strong. But in terms of any kind of national funding, there was very limited pockets that were very targeted um, in terms of performing arts venues through Creative Scotland, that some of our members were able to access funding. But across the piece, really very much kind of left to local authority and reserves to, to stay afloat. So we were coming out of the pandemic in an already fragile position for our members and now faced with utilities and with you know, cost of living, uh, salaries, which has already been mentioned, it simply becomes unaffordable. I mean, this is actually a very timely meeting for us. We had a, a members meeting of our Scottish members yesterday, and the word there was really crisis. You know, this is a, this is a crisis point, um, you know, far beyond anything that they saw during the pandemic, where there was always some light at the end of the tunnel and some hope of a return to normality. And similar to, to other colleagues here, the you know, return rates for our members, you know, have stagnated around, you know, 70 to 80 percent of pre-COVID footfall. And that includes for free to access um, cultural facilities as well. That's not purely on paid access. Um, so really, in terms of the, the income, the model for our members was a lot of the income, particularly on the cultural side, which is predominantly free to access, was through trading, you know, cafes, secondary spend really supported that model. That spend is essentially gone. You know, people don't have the disposable income. People aren't returning in the same numbers. So there's not that lifeline in terms of financial support. So the, the kind of essence of the model is essentially quite broken for where our members are at. I think this all kind of goes against as well, you know, the context of, of wanting to do more. You know, we know that there's the, the refresh of the, the culture strategy action plan and obviously very supportive of everything that's in that. But actually the reality on the ground is very much one of firefighting at the moment and just trying to stay afloat. So we're at the position where difficult decisions are, are starting to be made. Um, we also know that from projections from going forward for our members, you know, a core part of their funding is uh, management fees from local authorities. Those are continuing to decrease year on year. Um, and we had confirmation yesterday that some of our members will be moving towards zero. Um, so they've been given a timeline of moving towards zero um, local authority funding for leisure and culture at a local level, which obviously will radically change the entire delivery of those services. It will become a commercial model and a lot of the outreach, the health and well-being work, um, a lot of the free activities will have to be cut because there's no possible way to finance those going forward. So we're looking at quite a different reality if that comes to fruition, you know, and it, the timeline is looking at five years is what our members are being told um, for that, that cut to come into force. And that will be a very, very different landscape um, across Scotland. We're also very concerned in terms of the understanding, um, and it's already been touched on, around the connection between culture, health and well-being. You know, what will be the impact if services close? We're, I think we're going to see some of that this winter. We know that libraries are under particular pressure, um, and there's been reviews of library opening hours because there's no income from those services, and there's just not the funding to support um, operations at full capacity throughout the winter. And for us, that's really a bit of an alarm bell because those are obviously safe, warm spaces that people can access free of charge in their communities. If those are going to restrict hours or close temporarily, it's going to have a significant impact on the health and well-being of communities. We've already seen in the news some of our swimming pools, as an example, in Scotland are choosing to close because of energy costs over the winter. And we think that that's going to continue across into some of the cultural facilities as well. I think coupled with that, I think my colleague here talked about a perfect storm and that's you know, exactly the phrase that, that we would use. You know, we've got the, the staffing um, crisis, recruitment, retention. 
and obviously, as, as, as David mentioned, you know, kind of wages in the sector have never been great. Um, we're seeing a loss of skill and expertise from the sector as well. And obviously, when there's all this talk of you know, the um, uncertainty around cultural facilities, it's not encouraging the workforce. It's not creating an environment that people feel secure, that people feel valued. Um, and so there's a bit of a loss to other sectors, complete loss of expertise, skills, training, mm -hmm. that possibly will never return to the culture sector. And there's no immediate pathway for future talent to come up and come through and, and for the sector to be seen as an attractive place to work. We're already seeing um, theatres. We've got a couple of theatres within our membership um, that are saying they just don't have the technical staff. So actually this winter, they are not putting on as many shows purely because of a lack of technical staff. They may have the audience demand, but they're just simply not able to get the staff and the skills um, across Scotland to, to support that. So it is really quite a, a challenging environment in terms of um, coming back to the question around what Scottish Government can do. I guess for us, it's, it's looking at um, supporting the investment that's already been made into these cultural facilities, um, not just during the pandemic, but you know, a lot of our members are, are custodians of significant cultural assets across Scotland, and it's about protecting, preserving the cultural base that we have and enabling that to thrive. There's also making sure that local authorities are adequately resourced um, and encouraged to support culture at a local level. We know that local authority budgets are under significant pressure. Culture is obviously not statutory in terms of the services. There's some um, adequate provision around libraries, but that, again, is, is fairly flexible in terms of how that's interpreted. Beyond that, there's no statutory service, so it becomes a very easy-to-cut um, service. And I don't mean easy in terms of you know, taking that decision lightly, but when faced with the other parts of a local authority budget, there's sometimes just no choice other than to cut the non-statutory elements. And that's what we're seeing um, begin to happen, is a move from local authority thinking to really focus on cost management and not focusing on public service delivery and the wider impact of that, which I think is a danger. I think the other things that could be looked at, and again, these have already been raised and we popped these into our, our written evidence, is around a, a transient visitor levy. So understanding culture's role in attracting you know, people to come visit tourists you know, from the UK and wider. So actually supporting culture um, to be able to continue to provide you know, some of the world-class attractions that we have here in Scotland. Also, again, it's been touched on the percentage for culture, um, you know, being able to provide a, a ring fence pod of funding that can go back into cultural services um, and support, I suppose, the, the decreasing local authority budget that's, that's coupled with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and finally, um, I'm going to go to Julia Amour, um, Director of Festivals in Edinburgh, and then I'll be looking to colleagues to um, come up with supplementary questions. Julia. Thank you, convener. Mm -hmm. Thanks for inviting me, and, and uh, thank you to colleagues for the pretty sobering testimony of, of what it's like out there at the moment. And I know we're uh, not alone in the culture sector. Um, it's a difficult time. But uh, just initially per to say a little bit about my role and my um, members, um, Festivals Edinburgh is the uh, membership organisation and collective development body for the 11 major international festivals in the city, which are obviously also flagship festivals for Scotland, from the Science Festival in the springtime through the major August festival season to the next festival up, which is the Storytelling Festival um, and Edinburgh's Hogmanay. So we're moments of, of, of concentrated energy and focus where creatives come together and where audiences come together. And as such, I think we... Uh, are at the intersection of a lot of the issues that people have talked about today. Um, and I suppose the first thing I would say is that our, our immediate concern is really for the whole sector at the moment because of the, um, the great uh, energy shock in particular, but the, the, the perfect storm that, that, that Jim talked about. And uh, you referenced, Jim, the fact that people are facing those issues with their... Um, hundreds of percentage points increase in their uh, utility bills at different times. Um, some people are having to make decisions in the next week because the change is coming in October, and I really think that there's going to be some canaries in the coal mine you know, very soon. So uh, that's a, a situation that we're all going to find ourselves actually living and, and dealing with extremely, extremely quickly. So I guess I've got uh, a few observations that I hope are... Um, complementary and build on, on what's been said before that, that, that are about the immediate term and then about conditions for kind of reset, if you like. Um, the first is 
about whether there can be a sort of emergency review of those RFOs who've got those early cliff edges, because um, I, I'm, I'm lighting on RFOs not because the whole sector is not important, but just because that is a, a way of determining that nationally they have been identified as organisations that are strategic and should, should be supported in the long term. Um, some of the measures that are mentioned in, in various people's uh, evidence um, include th things like waiving of conditions, uh, simplifying of metrics and reporting, multi-year long-term commitments. Those will all be useful in due course, but obviously there will be some uh, cliff edges and crisis points coming sooner than that. So the, the, all the learning and adaptation that um, happened through the crisis funding in, in uh, the COVID lockdowns, I think, you know, should should help um, the national organisations to, uh, to to see what we can draw from that. Secondly, um, we've, we've heard a lot about the uh, way that we need to have a whole system thinking. Um, collaboration has an overhead. We all, we're all doing more of it. We all want to do more of it, but it does cost more because you have to understand your partners and adapt your ways of working and innovation needs investment. Um, and so for budget discussions, I, uh, I think I read it in Kirsty's evidence, um, uh, but, the, you know, taking more of a spend-to-save approach um, and whether, I, I don't know enough about how um, the, the streams have to be divided, but whether in the longer term there is there's something that could be a capital spend that is kind of like a restructuring fund for, um, for the organisation, because many people's evidence, um, many more people than are around this table today, has been uh, pointing to that kind of deeper issue of needing to uh, create the headroom and the space to not be in survival mode, but to be, to be able to kind of replumb and rewire, rewire the system. Um, and thirdly, um, uh, the work that other people have spoken about on uh, transient visitor levy and percentage for, for the arts, I think needs to be accelerated. Um, I know that it's been difficult to uh, find time for civil servants, I think, to work on the um, uh, manifesto commitment of the SNP for the public percentage for the arts for understandable, completely understandable reasons. But if those measures are not going to be helping to find new revenue streams um, before, say, 2026, which is a, a year that I've heard of, that's, you know, that's quite a time to bridge. And that, that's also a horizon that we need to have in our minds. Um, finally, um, when we talk about a mismatch between our how we value culture and how we fund culture, I think we do need to think about the benchmark with continental Europe, where um, there's a gap of about a third between the levels of funding av on average across the EU and the levels of funding in Scotland and the UK, um, and that's hundreds of millions of pounds a year. Now, you know, that would be a stretch target to, to, to address that, but you know, I think that these all need to be features in the conversation about how we... <coughs> Um, have a realistic rebasing between funding levels and expected outputs. Okay, thank you. I'm looking to, to members to see Dr. Allen his hand up first. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Checking it. Thank you, convener, and um, thank you for people being here with such interesting comments. I, I have a great deal of sympathy with what's been said, obviously, about the, the predicament of many um, people who have described their situation and have written evidence. And without... Um, Without trying to begin with an excuse, obviously, government finds itself in a similar position to many of your own organisations, fixed budgets, lack of flexibilities, and so on. I'm just curious to know what you feel we can do to ensure working better, more imaginative working together between government, local government, cultural institutions, um, to make real some of the, the things that you've talked about, for instance, the benefit of culture for health, for the benefit of... of of culture working together with the NHS and all these things that we've, we've raised in, in meetings um, previously on these subjects. I just wonder, I'm just looking for ideas about what can be done to make those things real that we all believe in but take a long time to achieve. Could I speak? <laughs> yes, certainly. Oh, no, please, please do come in, Janet, first. I, I mean, I would say work with the networks, um, and there are <clears throat> several in the room. Um, because we can draw on expertise, uh, experience, um, and hopefully provide um, succinct uh, thoughts and ideas uh, in relation to what might be able to be done, as well as illustrating the bleak circumstances that we're all facing at this point. Um, and uh, I suppose um, 
I would always say champion the arts. Um, spend on arts, I think, is still in the region of 0.5% of total spend. Um, that's not very much. If you cut the arts, you're not necessarily going to gain very much in relation to reinvesting into other things that have need. Um, those would be my points. And I suppose you look hard at um, policy and regulations. One point that I didn't flag was rates relief. Um, which obviously local authorities are looking at closely for charities and cultural organisations. It would be great if, if the ongoing premise of rates relief for charitable organisations, even in the instance where we're not occupying 100% of the space um, because we're still building back post or during the pandemic, um, it would be great to um, have a really clearly defined uh, national policy in terms of rates relief for charitable organisations. Yeah, um, please, Corinne. Yeah, um, Jim, thanks. particularly in the health and well-being one, I mean, actually, it doesn't need to be new money, but I think, I think ring-fenced money that people can see that they are able to apply to in collaborative projects with arts and, and healthcare sector is, is a really way of unlocking, th interesting way of unlocking things. I'll give you one quick example, actually, recently for, for, for us. We're working at the moment on a pilot project in the Astley Ainsley Hospital here in Edinburgh, which is a hospital that, that provides re rehabilitation services uh, for adults. Now, that's a pilot with Tonic Arts, which actually is, which is NHS Lothian's healthcare charity. But it's a £5,000 project. You know, and it took quite a lot of time to get that money together between us to go, let's just try something to see what can happen. What was interesting, though, in talking to uh, the team there, and a lot of these projects start with people who can really see the benefits. They said one of their real challenges at the moment is actually moving people on from being medicalised. That there are lots of people who are coming to Astley Ainsley for physiotherapy every week, not because they need physiotherapy in a hospital setting. They need to be moving every week and getting out into the community and having some kind of social activity. We could easily and do provide that, but there isn't a way at the moment you know, of, of them diverting money into that or of us having a model that says actually we could absolutely provide this kind of social exercise activity that involves dance that could happen in different locations around the city. But somewhere there needs to be a way of, of harnessing some resource to do that. You know, we, we had, in fact we have a programme uh, supporting uh, people living with Parkinson's at the moment, which has been running for a number of years previously in a partnership with Scottish Ballet. And again, that's really demonstrated the success of taking people out of a medicalised environment. They don't come, the, pe the, the people living with Parkinson's don't come for treatment to our studios every Wednesday or to the eight different places around Scotland that now do this. They come because they meet, people, they meet their friends, they do something social, and they do have a physical activity which is really useful for them. So we know it can work. We can see medical health, the healthcare professionals that see things can work. It's just there is, there is no way. If it involves people giving up funding for things that they have to do already, it's it's really not it's really not going to unlock it. I think that is really interesting to hear that. I, yeah. I'd seen the Parkinson's project. I think it came from New York as well. The, yes. the, 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 the dance company. Do Mark Morris, yeah. And um, the, the, it, it's about um, the confidence it gives the yeah. Parkinson's yeah. patients to be able to move yeah. freely. Again, it's quite quite um, profound when you see it in action. Um, sorry, um, if I bring, I'll bring you back in, Janet, but I'll bring Julia and then Kirsty in. Uh. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about the role of community workers in all of that, um, because we've uh, had great experiences over the last four years working on a long-range programme, partnership programme called PLACE. Um, and uh, one of the things that has been abundantly clear is that we need to have that strong relationship with the community hubs and the community workers um, and the way that their funding, as Kirsty described, has, has um, dissipated over the last decade has you know, left uh, them in a very difficult position to be able to um, pick up the opportunities that are available to engage with culture. And um, there's some great tools around in, in Scotland uh, uh, the, the local information system for Scotland, which um, you were recommending that everybody get their work onto, I think could be a, a very powerful tool, but you need those intermediaries to be able to, because um, we, we uh, are not in a good position to identify who could most benefit from the things that we can offer. You need those local experts on the ground to be, to be, to be able to do that. So it's, again, it's that system approach and making sure that it all works. And that, frankly, it's not very efficient asking 
uh, festivals that um, exist partly to bring the world to Scotland and Scotland to the world to, to also become community cultural workers, but we have um, created some fantastic relationships with those community cultural workers that allow us to bring those wider perspectives and uh, local, national, international um, outward facing opportunities to, to very localised, hyper local communities. Thank you. Kirsty? Thank you. Yes, I think there's, um, I mean, picking up on Julia's point there around uh, community workers, obviously social prescribing is, um, is a key avenue for enabling people to find activities that can support their health and well-being, but it is a bit of a, a pick and mix across Scotland in terms of how that works, or indeed if it's available um, in, in every community across Scotland. So there's something there around really embedding social prescribing much better within communities and having really clear pathways and opportunities. Um, I think part of the problem as well is that there may be social prescribing, but actually it, the activities run at 3 p.m. on a Tuesday, you know, so that doesn't suit a lot of people. It's actually having activities and opportunities available for people when they want to access those and also encouraging and embedding that and really recognizing there's been a lot of evidence around social prescribing, but it's never really fully been embedded. So there's a real opportunity there. I think also there's there's an opportunity to learn from best practice, you know, from other sectors as well. So the other part of our remit is, is sport and leisure. You know, and we know, for example, in the last couple of years, Sports Scotland has created a strategic partnership with Public Health Scotland, really around working much closer together across health, sport and leisure. We don't have something similar on the, the, the cultural side, which I think is a missed opportunity. Again, if we look at kind of sport and leisure, and apologise, that's the only other sector that I can really reference with any knowledge. But there's a, there was a document produced again during the pandemic about the positive contribution of physical activity, which was aligning physical activity across all of COSLA's priority areas, so really making the case at local government level around how big the contribution is. And we've had this discussion, we facilitate a group um, of what we call culture partners for Scotland. So um, Community Leisure is a facilitator of a monthly meeting of some of the cultural bodies across Scotland. And there's definitely an appetite to look at a resource like that for culture, um, you know, to really have a one page infographic document that can be going to local authorities to actually show the wider benefits across health and well-being and really make the case of that cross um, cross portfolio working but again at the moment we don't really have that really kind of clear snappy document so it's much harder to make the case when everybody's under pressure and headspace is limited to make those connections and strengthen them thank you uh, janet you wanted to come back in briefly um, just to pick up on points that others have made um, in, across scotland's workshops um, artists who work with us consistently say this is what keeps us well um, and communities say the same thing um, it there's a lot of um, really good socially engaged practice um, community engaged practice in in, in scotland um, led by individual artists uh, supported by organizations um, I think there's a lot of evidence, in, uh, as we've heard, in terms of uh, health um, benefits of arts practice. Um, I think the Scottish Government published a report um, just before I came to Scotland in 2010, um, which I read with great interest. Um, I'm not sure how much research there is on prevention. Um, so if taking part in the arts stops you from getting ill in some instances, not every instance, obviously, um, but if, if, if participation in the arts keeps you steady, it would be great to be able to have a, a more pithy argument to be able to make. Um, and I wonder whether that's an area that could be looked at in conjunction with um, the health service, um, just to see whether those who participate regularly in arts practice of all of its forms um, do actually go to the doctor less. Um, in, if we had if we had a sense of that, um, we might be able to make a better case. Thank you. Um, Donald, would you like to ask? Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, I, I think Julia used the word sobering, and I think that's uh, very much um, what I feel after hearing very striking evidence from everyone here. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, I'd just like to explore two issues. Um, one is clarity of funding. I mean, uh, I, I wonder if panel witnesses feel that they have that clarity of funding from Creative Scotland, from the Scottish Government. Uh, and I say that in light of um, the 
the issue raised a few weeks ago about the Youth Music Initiative, where uh, there, there was some uncertainty about funding. And I think it was, to be fair to Creative Scotland, was clarified that it was a pause rather than a, the, the, than a, a cessation. But do witnesses think clarity of funding is important? Uh, and going forward, um, you know, what, what could the committee do, what could the government do to help you with that? Uh, and my second issue that I'm quite keen to explore is builds on something that Alistair raised, which is flexibility. And we hit, we, we've heard this a lot. Um, and especially you know, a year ago, we were, the, you know, we were talking about COVID and the post-pandemic effects on the culture sector. But um, it strikes me that given the current pressures, very serious pressures, um, now is a real opportunity to think quite radically and quickly about flexibility, whether that's um, issues around um, reserves, using being able to use reserve, you know, build up reserves uh, over the years, multi-year funding, spend to save, very struck with that point about sort of rewiring the system. Uh, and what sort of, if you, if you had a shopping list of three things that would give you additional flexibility, what would they be? And could I start please with uh, Julia, seeing as you're next to me, <laughs> if you've got any, any right. views. Um, yes, I think that when budgets are tighter, and they have been tighter for the best part of 15 years now, the tendency is to become more specific and directive mm -hmm. and to say, well, I can't fund everything, so I'm going to make sure that I can uh, identify that I'm making a difference to that thing. But actually, I think that tendency has misled us as a country supporting our cultural sector because it just pulls people in multiple different directions. So, so the maximum amount of flexibility in order to enable people to do what they do best mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, innovate rather mm -hmm. than chase the money, I mm -hmm. think, is, is mm -hmm. something that we feel, we feel very passionately about. And that operates at all levels. It operates for our major international festivals and it operates for the community cultural organisations. There's some very good work that's been done by Whale Arts in Edinburgh, the chief executive there, about um, kind of utopian funding. What, mm -hmm. what does funding look like when flexibilities are maximised? Mm -hmm. um, and we saw some of that during the pandemic. Yeah. So I think that that um, waiving of original conditions on it or streamlining the mm -hmm. conditions as much as possible, um, the metrics and reporting, um, many of our organisations uh, in my membership are, are funded by the local authority, um, Creative Scotland, maybe uh, Event Scotland and Scottish Government uh, funds voted directly. And mm -hmm. And all of the conditions are different for those for those areas. I mean, sometimes when we have that conversation with them, they obviously say that they are tasked to deliver different outcomes. But I know there's been discussion going on with the National Partnership for Culture about outcomes um, and a sort of superset of outcomes and an ability to draw on that so that an organisation is not, you know, uh, spending a lot of its overhead on uh, application and reporting, but. Um, you know, able to agree with its funders um, a, a, a basket of indicators that 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 represent the value, the public mm. value that they bring for the public for the public pound would be would be great. Um, and I couldn't agree with you more about uh, you know the need to build up reserves mm. and and the need to be supported to have the headroom to change because it's very difficult to um, you know sort of have. A, a, have a health check while you're running a marathon kind mm -hmm. of thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, we definitely need to uh, to try and maximise those facilities. Does anyone else want to find that part? Yeah, go to David first, if that's all. Yeah, um, I mean, I've already re referred to it uh, briefly, but within the national collections, those which are directly funded by government, I think they do have clarity on funding. Unfortunately, it's a, a flat level. Um, and it's then their ability to react to changes in government policy. So your know, government has set your budget at this level and then said also we want to reduce the working week by two hours and we want you to pay a 5% pay rise which will be consolidated and we want you to pay that again next year and next year and next year. And against a backdrop of doing that while also freezing budgets and as I've already referred to, very strong restrictions because they're government bodies on how they can raise funds, or what they can charge for, is presenting them I think with a, an unsquareable circle. I think you can do maybe two of those things. You can have fair work, you can free, keep services at the current level, or you can freeze budgets. But I don't think you can do all three. 
uh, there are efficiencies they can make, but not at the levels we're seeing in terms of inflation costs or uh, energy costs and so on. And it's a time to which there is more and more demand for these services, more and more demand for uh, access to them, free cultural events, free, whether that's the National Nature Reserves, whether that's the National Museums or uh, Historic Scotland, there is demand for the public to try and access these. And it is very easy for these organisations to almost collapse down into doing the absolute core purpose for which they're in and not look about at some of these other work that, for example, Alistair was talking about, because it's simply not within their core core effort to focus on um, and it, to an extent you do see the, a similar situation in some of the charitable sector where there's uncertainty around funding their uncertainty around fundraising makes them contract down to the the core things they need to do um, and not deal with some of the wider problems uh, and not not plan for the future I, mean, I think it's coming into I say those colleagues have referenced uh, a perfect storm in that we were already in, for some organisations, they'd already cut down to a core and then this has happened to them. And it's not being in a position to react to that because they're already on an emergency footing before this year happened. Jim, you wanted to come in now? Yeah, uh, briefly on those, on, on the clarity of funding, actually, I'd echo what, what, what David said. I mean, we do, we do have clarity in both Creative Scotland and City of Edinburgh Council worked really hard in the context of annual funding to Scottish Government to say actually we want to give as much three years certainty as possible. The, the challenge with that has been is it has been three years certainty at the same amount. And also the challenge has been when I, when I joined the organisation in 2020 we had a pretty weak uh, model already and the core funding from Creative Scotland, it was brilliant that it was extended but it also stopped us having any conversation about how what the model of the organisation was. So again, we ended up with 11 years on the same amount of money, um, which, you know, it sounds ungrateful, but flat funding over a number of years also can be, prob can be problematic if you have to then deal with what happens during those times. Uh, on flexibility, I, I guess um, three things you said. Okay. Um, things actually government could do to help bring the cultural sector under its wing to support to support a lot of the, kind of the admin stuff. So one interesting thing we found out in the last few weeks, and we're actually already talking to Neil Gray directly about, is the Scottish Government Procurement Framework for Energy Purchasing. Now, almost none of our organisations knew about this, but there is theoretically the ability to join uh, for all third sector organisations to be part of a Scottish Government Procurement. That would be... You know, that should be made available and certain people should know about that better. You know, I and I'm sure many others are having to learn lots of things about dealing with, I'm sure our energy broker is very nice, but again, I'm, I'm not an expert on dealing with energy brokers and buying energy. So anything that we can do to, to, for, for government to take us under the wing of larger schemes would be really beneficial. Um, yes, the one on all, I'd, I'd echo what Julia said about reporting. I think we also need to realise not just the consistency of reporting to different organisations, but many of us are very small organisations. You know, I'm looking to be probably a 12-person organisation, uh, and we have to understand, you know, what is possible within that, within that size of organisation. Um, finally, I think the flexibility for organisations who, who, have, who have buildings as assets, but in many cases our buildings are still... There is still, there is still a, a, a hold on our buildings from those who originally, who originally paid for them. Um, more flexibility on what we might be able to do with our assets in terms of borrowing on them, in terms of potentially selling off part of them. And actually maybe more advice as well. There are all of these things I think we're trying to deal with now where it's not just about flexibility, it's about some help and advice on the kind of, the kind of big financial th things that you need to think about which are not in the, kind of the core skill set of... of people in relatively small organisations. Thank you. Um, Kirsty, and then I think Jenny's got a supplementary on this area, is that right? So, as I'll come to Kirsty then, Jenny. I guess just um, to um, echo what's already been said to some extent, you know, obviously clarity is, is really important. I guess from our members' perspective, you know, multi-year funding, and most of the funding at the moment is on a year-to-year -year basis. So there's not any real ability to really kind of forward plan over you know, two, three, five years, which would provide some degree of, of certainty. Though obviously, as, as Jim has mentioned, there are challenges even within um, kind of multi-year funding arrangements. But the other um, area for us is really kind of a move away from initiative-driven funding. There's lots of little pots of money out there 
but the time, the effort to put in applications for pots of money. And it's often for things that are seen as new. Actually, there's probably already programmes delivering something similar across Scotland. So we're not really recognising the best practice that we have. We're not really kind of scaling that or looking at how that, that can be shared better. There seems to be a constant look for something that's going to be the new, the best you know, thing that's going to come. And there'll be a, a time limited pot of money attached to that. But actually our members are saying it's almost not worth them putting in applications for that because of the time and the staff time that it takes to do that, to get it up and running. And then at the end of that programme, no matter how successful it may be, can they sustain it? Quite possibly not. So there's a real kind of challenge, particularly at the moment, between pots of money that are available, but actually our members are saying what they need is core funding to keep the lights on. They don't need initiative-driven funding. They need to be able to continue delivering the core services that they have. So it's really kind of clarity around moving away from always seeking new things to actually understanding what we have and preserving and protecting that. Thank you. Jenny? Convener, um, I'd like to really follow up on that, Kirsty, because that was um, kind of the area of my questioning was um, there's different sizes of organisations with different needs um, in different locations. And also, Janet, you talked about the fact that you're not simply in big cities, you're in perhaps more rural areas. So I'm just I'm interested if you could expand a wee bit more um, on your thoughts with regards to how flexibility is also required across Scotland perhaps, different different areas and how perhaps rural um, culture is um, simply the size that fits urban culture doesn't um, slot into rural culture as well. Absolutely. Kirsty, you want to? I mean I think it's a, it's a really good um, point because it's one again that comes up again and again for us is you know particularly our members in rural areas you know they have facilities services you know with very small populations but it's a, that's the lifeline of those communities. Um, and it's, so it's recognising the importance of every asset um, in different communities across Scotland. And the move that we have at the moment towards cost efficiency and cost management rather than you know, focusing on service and impact on communities is perhaps moving away from that. So there's more pressure on those, um, those smaller, some of the smaller venues because things are based on footfall or how many people attend um, various different programmes in a week. But obviously that is not taking into account the geography um, and the difference across communities across Scotland. So there's a real issue there um, around kind of the geography. But in terms of the flexibility as well, there's um, a, a real need for, you know, as, as most of our members, their assets are owned by local authorities, they're delivered through the trust model. But actually, it's the flexibility enabled by local authorities to look, <coughs> excuse me, at different ways of using assets. So moving away from perhaps the traditional model or what's perhaps you know the original contract that was written, but understanding that the landscape has changed and there's not always that flexibility. So there's still a, a real sense from some local authorities that things have moved back to what they were pre-COVID. So, you know, the opening hours should be the same, the services should be the same. Actually, the world's a completely different place um, in terms of customer behaviour, in terms of the crisis that we're in at the moment, but also in terms of people's appetite for what they want to engage in in their, in their free time. And we're not necessarily having the, the freedom and the flexibility to, to look at changing that. Um, I think there's a bit of a, a barrier to looking at change, and change is sometimes seen from some local authority partners as failure. You know, so something's not working, so you're changing it. Actually, the world is changing, and we need to be much more flexible. We also need to recognise, you know, from our perspective, our members are the experts. They are you know, the trust that are delivering these services. That is their core bread and butter. So they should have the full flexibility to make those decisions that are best for communities. That is what they are contracted to do. Um, and without that flexibility, they're not necessarily having the freedom to deliver what they would like to deliver um, or to use you know a library space in a slightly different way um, you know kind of moving away from what might be a, a traditional library model but actually it's not going to be right for every community um, and there needs to be some discussion around that and I think the final point linked to that is um, you know also looking at you know the transfer of assets you know it's something we don't necessarily look at enough um, in terms of community asset transfer you know both the good and the bad but again, what we've heard from a few local authorities is that that's a failure, either of the local authority or the trust. It's not necessarily a failure, it's a different model of delivery 
and it might be right for a different community. And we've seen some really good examples, but again, we're not able to really kind of look and, and have open discussions, open and honest discussions around what communities want. We still feels that there's quite a tight framework around the expectations of delivery. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I wondered if you, Janet, you were mentioned by Jenny in her question. I'll go to Janet first and then to Julia. Um, so, yes, I, I, I think um, the point about um, co-designing with communities and co-designing with artists uh, is a really important feature in, in Scotland's cultural landscape. Um, and I, I think the... I mean, it's interesting um, if you look at the arts funding system, and I, I always think in considering what next, you have to look back as to where we came from. Um, and the arts funding system was set up post-war um, it was essentially set up to distribute um, opera and ballet companies from London <laughs> to the rest of the UK. Um, and then infrastructure followed that, um, and so on. Everybody knows the history. Um, what's happening in Scotland, uh, or what has happened in Scotland alongside that, is the empowering of individuals and communities um, responding to the geography of Scotland. And some quite extraordinary work takes place, I think, in different parts of Scotland and I think the the ecosystem needs to accommodate that so possibly moving forwards we need to think differently in terms of how institutions work uh, and how they bring individuals um, through artists and communities into the fold uh, in order to co-design provision um, the Scotland's workshops um, in the main are artist-led organizations uh, which started off very small say so printmakers um, has had four homes in Edinburgh um, and um, essentially um, over the last period uh, in moving into uh, a new home in Fountain Bridge has grown exponentially but uh, we hold on to the values and the kind of premise of um, individually driven artist led activity um, and I think that's where Scotland has a lot of strengths and, and, and where rural areas particularly really benefit uh, if artists individually artists are empowered um, through, through appropriate funding measures um, so it's the balance, I think, that needs to be gotten right. Um, and perhaps now is the time in thinking about future-proofing the arts, which is, you know, I suppose, all of us who've worked in the arts for a long time feel really responsible for. Um, perhaps looking at that broader ecosystem and what's the need, um, and how can we safeguard public access to the arts, which ultimately is what's important with public funds. Um, how can we do that in the best possible way? Um, as well as cherishing our um, built estate in terms of buildings that have been developed to accommodate artists. Um, I think all of that needs to be looked at as a, in, a, in, a, in a holistic way. And the arts are a-changing. Um, and it, perhaps the model that was set up post-war isn't necessarily the right model for today's times. Thank you. Um, Julia? Um, I just wanted to make a point that, picking up on something Kirsty said about the need to recognise lifeline venues and rural communities and also I guess in town and city centres in a way because the, every, that, that's all having to be reinvented so cultural assets as local economic hubs I think is something that s seems better recognised in the kind of mission of Highlands and Islands Enterprise and South of Scotland Enterprise than it is in the mission of um, Scottish Enterprise in the in the central belt because as I understand it from high um, you know they're tasked with community sustainability and that means different things in a wider sense um drawing on some of the points about how you how you get in a well-being economy how you get both bits of that the well-being and the economy and i think culture does that extremely well and if we could see that more explicitly acknowledged in the um uh, tasking of uh, some of our national agencies that would be really helpful thank you um donald you can thank no, to, um, i'll bring in sarah please very much, Convener. Um, it's been really good getting your powerful evidence today, in addition to the submissions we've had from lots of organisations. Um, I can't think of a, a committee meeting where we've had um, phrases like a perfect storm, dire financial situation and crisis, and that that's been mentioned by so many witnesses, not just here, but in evidence. So it's thinking about how we fix it and what evidence we need to put back uh, to the Parliament. Um, there's been quite a lot of comments about percent for art, tourist visitor levy being potentially really important new additional monies, but they tend to be um, not something that you could guarantee everywhere. 
at the same time, so maybe very important. But what about the overall status of culture? Um, one of the bits of evidence we got from COSLA and the Directors of Finance said that funding in local authorities had been cut by nearly a quarter in the eight years pre-COVID. So there's something about reduction in funding at the local level, and then we got your comments about the flat funding challenge when all your costs are rocketing. So have you got thoughts about the equivalence of culture spending? It's not statutory. So is there something we should be recommending as a committee about the status of funding for culture, given the complexity on the ground and all the evidence we've seen in the work we've been doing in social prescribing about the wider benefits of culture? So benefits of health, well-being, um, benefits to the economy. How do we capture that in terms of saying culture is important and it needs proper funding? Has anyone got thoughts on that? How we, how we make sure it's ranked properly? Nobody's, nobody's jumping in desperate to answer that one. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting that you know, so Janet that mentioned the, the need for research in this area and, 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 and looking at it earlier. There's a mission, but Julia, you, you, please come in. I think there it would be good to take a fresh look at some of the um, evidence that was brought together in the last session of the Parliament about um, funding for culture in terms of European um, approaches to cultural rights and um, to the status of cultural workers and so on. I think uh, and I would like to say that we could make culture statutory under local authority budgets and that that would fix things but you know we all know that there's a cake at the moment and you know how do we make it a bigger cake rather than cut it into ever finer slices so um, uh, that's certainly something that we've been uh, very interested in is uh, the way that um, the European systems embed into their processes that that value that they that they give culture and that we give culture in this country as well as as as, as Jim uh, mentioned up front. Um, the other area that I think uh, could be acted on more quickly is incentives for philanthropy or um, the kind of reliefs that um, several people around the table have mentioned uh, in business rates and various other taxes. Um, I was having a discussion with a generous um, uh, philanthropy organisation um, the other day, uh, and they were echoing some of the same points that we've talked about this morning around long-term funding and um, flexibility of conditions for organisations to be able to do what they need to do. Um, but we find that they usually require some kind of foundational commitment to be there from the uh, public sponsors of, of uh, cultural organisations. So the more we can preserve um, the sense that yes, the, the, the culture sector is valued um, uh, so that we can continue to leverage up that, that sort of benefit, that would be great because the um, Edinburgh Festival system, for example, is about 15% public funding and 85% income generated. Um, and that, you know that's between sponsors, donors, and uh, audience members. But uh, the, 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 difficult, the thing you have to keep in mind is that whole system, because that will be, you know, it's, those percentages are not always the same across the whole of Scotland, but we're, we're trying to be um, uh, irrigating of the whole kind of local economy. And if we move the system in a certain way, we will only have the 15% of public funding and we won't have the 85% of, um, of, of, of the rest of the, the funding that comes into that system. Uh, Janet, I didn't see it. And I'll come to Kirsty after that. I would say make it statutory, um, even at a tiny, tiny percentage, um, because as a principle, it feels important. Uh, but I concur that that's not necessarily viable. Um, I think there is more opportunity for the national system and the local system to work more coherently together. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we all have separate funding ag agreements with uh, our national fund of Creative Scotland and with um, our local funders, uh, which requires double the time from, uh, uh, in terms of administration to be able to actually deal with that. Um, if we could, could join that up um, and require that to be joined up, um, and in the old days, one would say you wouldn't fund a local area unless a local authority was able to contribute as part of that package. That isn't always possible now, but you might say um, a, a package of support needs to be provided by the local authority. That includes rates relief. That includes um, 
other kinds of um, professional support or, or incentives um, that make life easier for cultural organisations. If, if that could be worked through, then I think that would be transformative for how we how we function. Um, even when it comes to identifying KPIs, um, if they can line up uh, and be the same ones, then we're not um, spending time administering the arts as opposed to actually delivering on the ground. Okay, Kirsty. Thank you. Um, I mean, I guess in terms of the the argument around statutory, I'm not sure from our perspective it make any real significant difference. Um, and we obviously understand, you know, local authority, you know, budgets are within a, a fixed envelope. So actually, there's you know a finite financial resource there. So you know, as you said, there's there's difficulties um, in terms of how that's that's allocated. Um, I think for me, it comes back to some of the earlier points around the cross um, departments working and looking at different pots of funding and kind of joining those up. So looking at the areas that culture contributes across different areas, you know, whether that's, you know, mental health, well-being, whether it's economy, whether it's education. Um, so that, I mean, there's a whole range of, of areas that culture contributes significant amounts um, in terms of the outcomes it delivers, but there's not necessarily any funding. I realise it's a challenge and obviously at the moment we're seeing a little bit of a move towards protectionism around budgets because everything is tightening but really what we need to do is kind of the reverse um, and actually try and have better conversations across departments um, around outcomes and you know focusing on what it is we want to achieve and how we get there rather than kind of the silo pots of funding which I think there's still a bit of a tendency for um, both at, at national and, and local government level. And I think you know Janet's point around that you know central and local governments you know kind of working better together and having much clearer um, support between the two I think would also be helpful um, in, in terms of streamlining some of that funding and, and making it kind of flow easier to where it needs to be. Um, and I think the final point really is around is around the research. You know, there's a lot of research out there. There's, there's an abundance of evidence around the impact of culture on health on well-being. But it's how we utilise that. Um, I think sometimes what we do as a sector is, is try and find a new bit of research that's going to make the case and it's going to be the thing that transforms hearts and minds. Actually, there's probably a lot of information out there, but we're not using it in a collective way um, as, a, as a sector in the best way to maximise that message. So it's understanding what it is that's going to actually make the case change hearts and minds. Do we have it? And how do we articulate that? And I think that needs to be a much wider joined up approach to really have any impact. Okay. Thank you. Mark, can I invite you to... Yeah, I think it's been very powerful evidence this morning. And I, I think what I've taken from it is the sense that, you know, the world has already changed. And it's about, you know, if organisations have to change, it's not a sense of failure, but there needs to be that headroom and that support to enable that change to happen. And I'm sure that other sectors are having to think about how they respond to the new world as well, including health. Um, I think uh, Julia and Janet and Kirsty will mention the transient visitor levy. I mean, there is a commitment from the government to deliver that in legislation in the next year. But I'm just wondering what, what the conversation has been at the local level around that levy, because, you know, clearly it will be a discretionary power that councils can use. And, you know, it may even be discretionary in terms of what they can spend it on as well. Um, although I, I think there's a very strong argument that it needs to be put into culture and well-being. Um, so I, I, I don't know how that local conversation is panning out and obviously there will be some dissenting voices in the use of such a, a levy from parts of the hospitality sector who maybe don't, don't understand the benefits of how it could be used. So I'm interested to know how those early conversations are going because whether it gets used or not is going to be pretty critical and pretty critical to extra funds that could be brought in. So. I don't know who, Julius, you're nodding quite a lot, but do you want to come in? Um, it's, it's obviously in the public domain that the City of Edinburgh Council has um, committed to working to bring in the transient visitor levy when they have the power to do so. So we have had quite a lot of discussions at local level about those very questions. Um, and I've been very buoyed up by the degree of consensus from across council members but also uh, civic organizations about the fact that there needs to be a kind of virtuous circle between you know what the money is raised against and how it is invested so um, the idea that it would be tempting to divert it into a general pot for general needs I think is is something that people across the board want to resist um, even in difficult times and some of the things that we've been talking about uh, 
seeing the funding going to would be uh, solutions to some of the issues that high demand on a, on a city from visitors can in, in concentrated bits in the city centre can bring and stimulus for more sustainable and, and, and good growth in tourism. So under solutions, obviously some of the city management issues which were amplified in the last two weeks of August with the um, refuse workers uh, strike um, are, are top of mind in this city. Um, and also some of the things around community culture that uh, we've been talking about this morning, I think, could uh, be very much helped by uh, a new revenue stream that could go to, in a ring-fenced way to that sort of purpose. In terms of stimulus, obviously, uh, we think the cultural offer in Edinburgh is world-class and uh, needs, needs to be rebased because it's had that erosion over more than a decade. Um, and... We are also talking locally about what succeeds, what was known as Marketing Edinburgh. You know, how do we uh, manage tourism and uh, stimulate uh, sustainable and responsible tourism in the future? So those are some of the, the purposes in Edinburgh that we've been talking about. Uh, Kirsty and Janet, you're, you're both of your networks, I mean, are there similar conversations happening across Scotland or is this just an Edinburgh conversation at the moment? To, yeah. to jump in, if that's Kirsty, all right. Kirsty, yeah, please. Um, so, I mean, from my perspective, most of the conversations are within our membership network um, at the moment, but it is very much, you know, understanding that it would be discretionary. So this is not going to be something that's, you know, guaranteed across the whole of Scotland, but it's about the encouragement. And I think what there's a desire for is a steer from um, central government, you know, to really kind of mandate that if there is a, a visitor levy, you know, within a certain area, that at least a proportion of that would go towards culture. You know, so taking away, you know, as Julia talked about, that um, possibility of it being kind of a general pot where it would be anticipated that it would be kind of you know, sucked into other areas that have um, greater financial needs. So it's more about the ring fencing a, a proportion if this was to come you know, into force and having a very, very clear steer around the role of culture in, in the visitor economy and making sure that that's protected. Um, and uh, I noted that SCAM, I think, had referenced um, a transient visitor levy mm -hmm. and a percent for in their submission. Um, so clearly a conversation amongst the visual arts community. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not privy to the detail at local authority level across the country, um, but I agree that if culture is the magnet that draws tourists to Scotland, which we know it is, then culture should benefit um, in relation to any income drawn mm -hmm. down through that route. Okay. Sarah, sorry, I didn't make it back in earlier. Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, I want to thank everyone for the answers. And I think that last discussion really reinforces the need for thinking about how you do get the cross-government working that I think you referred to very powerfully, Kirsty, because we've had some discussions about health and well-being and culture and the potential benefits. And I suppose with the budget coming up this year, it's how you make that maybe more explicit have you thought, and the, the evidence that you, or the, the information you gave us about how to make um, processes more straightforward, KPIs, given the differences between very big organisations and maybe more smaller, lighter foot community-based organisations, that's quite powerful. Um, so just thinking about one of the things that you've mentioned, a couple of, a couple of you, and certainly in the evidence, is about staff changes. We got that evidence when we talked to venues earlier in the year over COVID. Um, and I think it's in your evidence prospect. Um, but the, the loss of young people from the sector who don't see it as a long-term career seems quite significant. Is there work that's been done in the sector to try and retain people in the sector and the skills and make it a, an ongoing career option for young people? I don't know if you, David, or Kirsty, want to come in on that to start off. David, do you want to come in first? No, yeah, thank you. you. Uh, unfortunately, actually, the, the greatest turnover we see in the sector, in the certain areas that we deal with, is around people who are new to it, and who, who have been, come, come in. Um, some of it is, is salaries, as you as, as expect, would expect me to say. Um, but actually, a lot of it's to do with insecure funding and insecure contracts. Kirsty's referred to pots of money. And... Unfortunately, that can lead to a habit of saying, well, the pot of money is for three years, therefore the contract is for three years. Um, and people either don't have that contract extended or indeed, more naturally, are worried that it won't be extended and then look for other work before the project ends. 
and it's I think it's one of the reasons why we're seeing such a high turnover now um, where people previously would have come into the sector and stayed with it and worked in an institution and worked through it to become experts within their area they simply cannot find that way into those organizations and come into the sector and then leave again Kirsti? Yeah, and I think the point around you know the, the insecure contracts you know, and then obviously the link to funding is absolutely right. Um, I think also there's been a bit of a rebalancing um, of people's priorities, particularly post-COVID, um, and the fact that a lot of cultural um, work is you know what might be seen as antisocial hours because you know a lot of facilities are open at weekends or you have live performance which takes place in in the evening. And that's not necessarily something that people have wanted to come back to um, post-COVID. They've wanted to kind of move and rebalance time with families and kind of rebalance their, their work and personal life. So there's been quite a significant loss um, because of that as well. And obviously um, salaries not being able to, to compete um, in, in that sense. There is a lot of work that's um, going on, and I know there's other organisations um, such as CC Skills that are really looking at um, you know, workforce in the cultural sector and attracting people um, and supporting organisations to recruit. There's been quite a lot um, of changes in, in recruitment processes. I mean, our members are, are talking about having open days um, and having the interviews on those open days, because actually if they have an open day, somebody signs up for an interview, they're not then turning up for the interview because they've got another job offer. So there's really a kind of time pressure in terms of trying to attract people, present an attractive proposition to them, and also kind of snap up people at that time. And there's a real kind of look at um, you know, benefits um, that can be offered because there's not the salaries that can necessarily compete with other sectors. So what can be offered in terms of some of the wider benefits? So I know that our members are really looking at some of that flexible working, looking at kind of health well-being supports, and um, some of the softer benefits that can be offered. But it is a, a very difficult um, kind of recruitment market for the sector at the moment. Um, and there's really a need to attract more people and to retain people within the sector. But, you know, as, as David said, the insecurity and a lot of the media around it is not helping um, people to feel mm -hmm. a sense of security or to see a career pathway. You know, a lot of people are seeing it as kind of an entry level job, but nowhere to go after that. And I think what we need to really do is, is create very clear pathways for people to develop, grow and progress so that we keep those talented people within the sector. Thank you. I think this will have to be a final word from you, Jim, on this. Just to add, I think in, in, in our world, because our, our role is about supporting independent dance artists, so people who are not in a dance or one of the two dance companies that, that exist in Scotland, they very much have careers that involve that artistic practice, involve working in retail or hospitality, involve teaching dance, involve working in organisations like ours. And I think, yeah, all of the things that have been talked about before, about the increasing insecurity of jobs, um, mean that we are losing artists from the from from dance just as much as people from the uh, from the administrative or the organisational side of things because people just cannot make a career that adds up between all of the different between their professional practice and everything else that they might need to put in there to to, to, to earn a living. So my bigger worry, I think, is actually this is not just about people working in organisations; it's about the artists that we exist to support. Okay. Janet, I'll give you a final word. <laughs> Very quickly, um, I suppose I'd just say the words opportunity cost. So we have spent the last 70 years, 65 years, training, educating, building expertise in arts organisations. And if we let that go, what's it going to cost to be able to get it back in the future? Um, so I would feature that in any thinking in relation to that very small percentage of government spend that currently is invested in the arts. Thank you. I'm afraid that it probably run out of time for this session. We've got another session um, immediately after this. So thank you very much for your attendance. And as I said, for your written and oral evidence today, it has been uh, profound. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and I'll suspend to onboard new witnesses. Thank you.
agenda item is to continue to take evidence in Scotland census and can I welcome to the meeting this morning Angus Robertson MSP cabinet secretary for the constitution external affairs and culture Paul Lowe register general for national records of Scotland who's joining us remotely this morning Pete Whitehouse director of statistical services national records of Scotland and Penelope Cooper director of culture and major events at the Scottish government and could I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement? Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, uh, Committee colleagues. Uh, following the closure of the main census collect period on the 31st of May, on the 22nd of August, the census coverage survey also came to an end. And while this mar may mark the end of live operations for Scotland Census 2022, it certainly doesn't mark the end of the work required to deliver high quality census outputs. Scotland Census is a highly complex programme, uh, which in common with other modern censuses consists of many elements. While it's understandable that much of the focus so far has been on the public-facing elements of the census, particularly the census return rate, that in itself is not the deciding factor in determining the success or not of a census. As the International Steering Group set out in the paper they provided to the committee, and as Professor Sir Ian Diamond and Professor David Martin explained during the evidence session two weeks ago, it's the combination of three pillars which will deliver the high quality census outputs that users require. High quality census returns of which an almost 90% return rate has been achieved, a coverage survey and peer reviewed statistical techniques and the use of high quality administrative data. This was the first primarily online census and generally this worked very well with 89% of respondents completing online. This exceeded the national record for Scotland's target of 75% and clearly indicates a strong preference for the majority of citizens to use digital rather than paper completion. The shift in public preference should be taken into account for any future census exercise or similar significant public engagement. This is also the most flexible census ever, uh, delivered with options for completing digitally by paper form and also through assisted completion by telephone uh, and field force. Despite concerns, the month-long extension to the collection period also led to a significant improvement of return rates at both national and at local levels. The national return rate increased by 10 percentage points since the 1st of May but crucially, the extension also ensured that there was enhanced coverage across the country, with 30 of 32 local authorities achieving return rates of more than 85% and no authority less than 83%. 18 of those local authorities achieved a return rate greater than 90%. There are, however, some emerging indications of shifts in public attitudes in Scotland to the importance of the census, and there is a need to understand these. This phenomenon appears not to be restricted, however, to the census, but is emerging in other areas, for example, completion rates in broader Scottish social surveys. The committee recently heard from Sir Ian Diamond that this is a trend which has been seen in declining participation rates across recent years. And as such, it will be important to understand and plan for such an event up front in the design and risk management for any future census. However, with a final return rate of 89.2%, I hope the committee members and indeed the public are reassured by the words of the International Steering Group, who in their submission to this inquiry noted that they, and I quote, consider that the main census enumeration has provided the foundation for a high quality set of census outputs in terms of coverage of the population. And indeed, Sir Ian Diamond's evidence that the census in Scotland will still produce, and I quote, really good data. As recommended by the International Steering Group, the National Records of Scotland are working at pace to secure the necessary access to key administrative data sets for the purpose of census estimation and adjustment. This expansion and enhancement of administrative data use beyond the original plans for estimation of census response will put NRS in a strong position to deliver a high quality set of census outputs for Scotland's 2022 census. The Scottish Government and NRS are extremely grateful for the time and expertise that the International Steering Group continue to provide as they move through planned post-collection quality control and assurance work. Over the coming months, National Records of Scotland will continue to focus on planned post-collection quality control and assurance work to deliver the high-quality census outputs users require.
Finally, I also put on my record my thanks to the millions of households who participated in Scotland's Census 2022, and I look forward to answering your questions today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. If I might open with um, a question about um, one of the um, criticisms at the time um, of the census was the decision to delay. Um, the committee has since heard um, quite a lot of evidence um, about the, um, it not being a reasonable comparison to compare national records to Scotland with the, um, the, the UK Statistics Authority in terms of capacity, budget and indeed where they were in analysis of the data. So um, uh, now that we have a sort of better understanding of that, are you content that that was the right decision to make at that time for the quality of the census? <clears throat> uh, yes, I am. Um, uh, this is me looking back at the decisions that were made at the time, um, uh, which I didn't play a, a part in, but obviously it's important to look at and try and understand the rationale uh, behind decisions that, that were made. I mean, firstly, there's an, there's an international context to, uh, to all of this. Um, out of 83 nations um, that plan to conduct censuses over that period, 59 of them, that's 71%, delayed their census field collections. That included not only Scotland, uh, but many uh, others, obviously, Germany, uh, Italy, and Ireland being, being three. Can provide the list to the committee if one would wish to know which other nations that amongst the 71% who made the same decision uh, were only 10 countries, that's 12% in that period, um, proceeded with their field collection as previously planned. So I'm satisfied that the rationale, and not losing sight of the fact, that the advice to the public uh, was uh, to minimise contact with one another uh, at that time, uh, and that was the wider context of holding a census during the biggest pandemic in 100 years. And so I'm content uh, that the correct decision was made. Um, and uh, now that we know that we are um, within touching di distance of a 90% return rate for the, the census itself um, and can be assured that the quality of the data is of the standard that is required to complete the census, I think the right decision was made at the time, yes. Thank you. I'm going to move to questions from committee and can I go first to Ms Boyack. Thank you very much, convener. Um, can I ask you, Cabinet Secretary, you, you referred to changes in society's attitude this morning and you also referenced it in your ministerial statement. Um, how much work have you done on that issue? Because um, you've just flagged that um, other countries uh, delayed their uh, census, but in, in terms of compared with the 2021 census and the rest of the UK, what are the comparative differences in terms of low turnout areas and what lessons do you draw from that and what are the issues going forward um, because we've not had the same level of lower turnout rates historically? So we could probably use our the whole time of the session to discuss this question because it's a nub of trying to understand the experience of the recent census process here and trying to understand what will be required to take place at the time of the next census to make sure that we are uh, able to collect the appropriate quality of data from society. And I spent a lot of time with my professional colleagues who are here and, and online throughout the process of the uh, census collection period trying to understand the phenomenon of reduced uh, collection rates, um, especially in certain parts of the country. And I'll let them do some of the, the technical statistical explanation for that. I should say that this is something that is being currently evaluated. So you're, you're asking to us to take, a, um, take, a, uh, uh, take the temperature on the basis of what we understand thus far without having completed all of the work. Um, but you know, I'm sitting giving evidence to colleagues who are unusual um, in uh, society in that we, we actually spend quite a lot of time knocking on doors as MSPs and as candidates. And uh, having been out, as indeed has Ms Boyack, who was out, and I'm appreciative that she and a number of other MSPs took the time to go and actually see how the census was being collected, 
and was able to see the phenomenon which I think is entirely consistent with what we as members of the sort of democratic um, political community are aware of. That is a reducing rate of participation in elections, reducing turnout, reducing rates of data that we are able to collect when we do doorstep visits, uh, higher, um, uh, higher uh, numbers of people saying that not, they're not prepared to say um, in the case of uh, election times, what they're thinking about voting, um, and hearing a variety of reasons to explain why they won't be taking part. Before the end of the census collection uh, period, I said to colleagues at NRS that I thought it was going to be particularly important to understand in qualitative terms and quantifiable terms the reasons for people who were not, not participating themselves. What, what were the reasons that they were giving, as opposed to that others were interpreting that they were um, giving? Uh, and it's, it, it's really quite instructive and worth sharing with the committee so it's, it's on the record. Um, so um, 1,200 people, so this is larger than a standard opinion poll sample size, um, were asked, and these are people who hadn't returned their census forms, what were their main reasons for not completing? Why were they not doing so? Uh, the biggest reason, 35%, was that people felt that they were too busy. They didn't have enough time. The next biggest reason, 17%, was that they were not aware of the census. Uh, the next biggest reason, 14%, said that they didn't realise that they had to complete it. And then lastly, but these all came in at 5% or less, were concerns about privacy, about trust in government, about the nature of questions, about access to paper, etc. All of those points came in at less than 5%. I would imagine that most people in this committee would recognise that kind of response from the times that we knock on people's doors. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that by the end of the process, nigh on 90% of people had returned their census rate. The question is, how much more does one need to do in 2022 or in 2031, 32, with it by the time the next census comes around, to maintain that high level, high return rate? And I note, again, my, my colleagues who are much more versed in the statistical side of this uh, will be aware that New Zealand, uh, who are about to uh, begin, I think, next year, uh, undertake their census, uh, have set their target for a return rate of 90%. And so my observation in this is that we are seeing a phenomenon here in Scotland which is not unique. Uh, it's one that is occurring in other countries. The question is, what can we learn from our experience so that we can maximise the rate of return next time around? Um, sorry, I don't want to hog the microphone here. There are colleagues from NRS who are wanting to um, make a contribution at this stage. I know that there is a lot of um, evaluation work that is being undertaken, and, and no doubt when that's published will be shared with the committee. But are there any sort of things that colleagues would wish to flag up at this stage um, in relation to my answer to Ms Boyack? I think Mr Whitehouse wants to, to uh, come in, but okay. um, Ms, if Mr Lowe, if you could raise your hand if you, you want to come in. I, I can't see you on screen, um, but I'll provide Mr Whitehouse. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think um, the, the, the way I would look at it is that we, we know that there are areas of, of the country, and this is uh, Professors Martin and Sir Ian Diamond talked about this, where response rates are, are lower. They're lower in the English and the Welsh survey, and they're lower in the Northern Irish survey. And so we know going into our census that, um, that, there's, that certain areas have there's more difficulty in terms of getting responses and that's why we skew a lot of our work, a lot of our effort, a lot of our communications to get to those areas and those communities. So we need to evaluate and work out how effective that has been and whether there are other variations 
that one can employ. But I think what is coming through, and this would have been the same that was as the professors talked about, is that the general nature of is as of people not wishing to respond to surveys and censuses in the same way, and that is across the globe. So when we look at our census, we now need to look at a programme of work that has at its absolute centre, if we're going to do something akin to the 2022 model, is that big data collection, and as I said, that's 2.3 million households responding. That's vast amounts of information. We understand where we've then missed households. We do some complex, and Sir Ian talked about it, it's sort of, he's very interested and excited by the opportunity to do this statistical work, as I, am I, as a, as a professional statistician, but it's, it's interesting. It solves a problem, but into that space is much more use of administrative data. And the benefit of that is that understanding through our, you know, through our good data that we hold, whether that's through our health system or elsewhere, helps us both understand the, the communities that we haven't had returns from, helps us get a very good estimate of the population therefore, and then helps us do good statistical estimation about the nature and the characteristics of those communities. So as we know, some of the communities that are most going to benefit from the census outputs are where response rates have been more challenging. And that is where we are needing to do the work now with the administrative data, with our estimation work to unpick that and provide the best quality data, which is our ambition. But as, as the cabinet secretary says, the, these are problems that are existing around the globe now and therefore some of the benefit of the International Steering Group but also the benefit of the international census community is to explore and invest in that and that's part of our lessons learned as well. Thank okay. you. Uh, Mr. Lowe. Thank, thank you, convener. Yeah, just to, just to add a couple of points. I mean, we, we, we've seen and I think we we, we noted in the evidence session uh, back in June that, 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 that there is a phenomenon around this. But even if we look at our own census in Scotland in, in 2001, it was a 96% response rate. In 2011, it was a 94% response rate. So there has been evidence over the last couple of censuses of response rates gradually reducing. Now, it was our expect expectation, as it was for ONS and NISRA, that we would attempt to get a response rate over 90% and mirroring uh, that of the previous census in 2011. And obviously in our case, uh, we've got just under 90%, which is a good and robust response. But as others say, this is a challenge that's, that's being seen around the globe. Um, the Cabinet Secretary referenced the, uh, the New Zealand census, the 2023 census. Now they take their census every five years. Their last census in 2018 uh, achieved a response rate of 83.3%, which was you know, notably lower than the position in Scotland. Um, but they were still able uh, to produce credible census outputs from that level of response rate. Um, we are, as, uh, as, as uh, Pete has said, seeing this in other social surveys. These are gathered by Scottish Government. So, uh, these, you know, some of the big social surveys you'll be aware of, such as the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey, uh, the Health Survey, the, 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 uh, the Household Surveys that are run and are run as doorstep surveys in the run up to kind of 2019 and 2020, all of them have been showing progressively reduced um, response rates. Now they are voluntary, you know, voluntary surveys, of course, and people can decline them, but it does point to that broader trend. Uh, I'd also give the example of um, the ONS's labor force survey, um, which they undertake, and that's also seeing declining returns and they're now getting sort of in the lows of 50% sort of territory uh, in, in that survey as well. So, so this is not a, unique phenomenon to the census, but it does provoke the question of what do you then do if society's attitudes are shifting in, the, in, in that way and how do we make sure that we increasingly build this into the design of future census activity? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for those responses. Um, it, it's clearly been in much lower income areas. So in terms of the communications of those communities, um, I, I did specifically ask about different lessons across the UK in terms of numbers and outputs. Um, and I think 
uh, people were surprised at the, the lower outcomes. So what lessons do you draw, Cabinet Secretary, in terms of that communications, learning the lessons from this time for the future? Is it education? Is it stronger communications before the census so that people are actually aware of it and that they do prioritise it given the importance in terms of all the decisions that get made subsequent to the census on the basis of the return? So, <clears throat> first of all, I think it's important to understand the context of what communication was there with households. Um, because there seems to be an impression with some um, that there may have been too little communication about the fact that there was a census, why there was a census, um, uh, its importance, its relevance, one's responsibility for taking part, uh, that it might be explained in ways for people who English might not be a first language uh, or for people who have other um, access um, uh, issues. So all of these were considerations that were explored fully before the beginning of the census, which then led to a frankly gigantic communication um, uh, effort. I, I will spare the committee me going through every individual type of communication that was sent out to households in Scotland. But again, just for reference for the scale so that it's on the record, 2.7 million initial contact letters, 1.4 million initial reminders, 1.1 million second reminders, 679,000 further reminders, up to five reminders for non-responding households, 351,000 paper questionnaires that were requested by households, 165,000 paper questionnaires that were proactively sent out on a targeted basis to help people complete the census. In addition to that, so that's people being proactively communicated with directly to households, field staff from the census visited 680,000 households. They made a total of 1.6 million household visits in total. They handed out 92,000 paper questionnaires uh, to households. I could go on about the work of the contact centre, the amount of times that the website was used, um, and so on. Um, <coughs> it is difficult to understand that people would have the opinion that they did not know anything about the census when so much was delivered to their household, or in the case of some house households, up to 10 visits from, um, uh, from NRS uh, enumerators. And Ms. Boyack is absolutely right to point out um, that there were particular, especially social demographic areas, where uh, the rate of return uh, was lowest. But I have to say, it is where the degree of effort to try and communicate with people was highest. It was most targeted. It was most targeted from the start, and then during the collection process, where there was a, a divergence between um, the projected rate of return with the actual rate of return, there was a significant targeted effort uh, that was made uh, to try and make sure that areas where there was a lo the lowest rate of return, um, uh, that gap could be uh, closed. And, and this is the, the heart of the conundrum, uh, which is people saying, we have people saying, I did not know about the census, I did not understand why it was important, I did not have enough time to do it, although the process ran over months, um, and you have to weigh that up with the fact that people were communicated with. I mean, uh, so that I, I talked, a convener, about what was happening in terms of direct communication, in terms of general societal communication. Uh, it's 561 uh, times television adverts uh, were run. 68% of the Scottish adult population saw them at least once. 51% of the Scottish adult population at least three times. Radio adverts that were run 11,873 times. The idea that the census was not communicated or was not communicated effectively just does not stand up uh, to any fair uh, scrutiny. Um, but there is clearly a disconnect with some people who, for their own reasons, explained that they weren't aware, did not have enough time, and the other reasons that we, we know about, with the fact that notwithstanding the fact that there was extremely full-spectrum communication 
from mail to doorstep visits to um, uh, very, very high profile advertising, that still a proportion of the population was extremely uh, difficult um, to reach. Um, I think uh, Ms. Boyd will have had the experience in watching enumerators going to doors after doors after doors and people not being in, and then people who did answer then saying that they weren't going to take uh, part. Um, so was that a moment in time? Um, I'm not sure it is for the reasons that Paul Lowe has said, given the international and comparative information that we're aware of. Does that mean that we shouldn't think about things and learn lessons? Absolutely. And this is where I come to Sarah Boyack's question about what is it that we can be doing um, and doing more of. I think the education point that she makes is a very, very good one. Uh, what is it that can be done, especially in communities with the lowest rates of return in advance of the census? to increase understanding in family households, for example. So this is something that one could do more of. Incidentally, this did happen <laughs> in Scottish schools in the run-up to the census. So again, another effort was undertaken in advance. Is that something we should do more of? Yes, it is. Um, if anybody has any ideas um, of uh, further ways in which we can uh, reach uh, hard-to-reach communities because uh, and I'll look to my colleagues to give some more information on this, the number of third sector organisations that played a part in the census 2022 is remarkable. Um, from faith groups and community groups to charities and employers, um, the, 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 the number of organisations across Scotland runs into the hundreds who were doing their best internally um, to help explain to uh, attendees at the mosque, um, to people who used uh, uh, certain charitable services, to, and the, the examples go on. Every um, effort was undertaken to try and think, how can we reach people, especially those who are hard to uh, reach? Um, and at, at one stage, uh, the offer was made to members of the Scottish Parliament um, uh, to uh, help provide community leadership. Uh, in certain communities where return rates uh, were low, or church ministers uh, to do uh, likewise. One really did uh, try and harness uh, all available routes to, to reach, uh, especially communities uh, where the return rate uh, was lowest. And just on this final point, um, the um, direction of enumerators during the extension period uh, to parts of the country where the rate of return was lowest was absolutely scientific. It was, where is the lowest return rate? Where are the enumerators that we have who are trying to drive up the return rate? And one was even trying to do it on the doorstep, direct manual um, completion of, of the census, standing in front of people um, at the doorstep or helping people um, with uh, written questionnaires and in those communities where the return rate was lowest. And did it work? Well, absolutely it did, because if you look at the change in the uh, extended period of the census, where the highest rates of return, uh, the biggest change in rates of return was, were in those um, parts of the country where there had been the lowest rates of return for the social demographic reasons that Sarah Boyack um, uh, identifies. So uh, is there more that can be done? No doubt. But I would definitely not want people in the committee and elsewhere to be under the impression that, that there was not a significant effort across all means uh, to try and uh, get the maximum return rate in the census. There most, there most certainly was. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cameron? Uh, uh, thank you. Good morning to the Cabinet Secretary and um, uh, its officials uh, and from the NRS and other elsewhere. Um, could I ask you, first of all, um, in terms of the, the cost of the census, um, I think you indicated in June that the extension came with an additional cost of, uh, I think, it, approximately nine million, although that, that was revised. Um, could you advise the committee on the cost of the final cost of the extension and the final total cost of the census? Yes. The additional expenditure 
was £6 million, uh, and that equates to 4.3% of the uh, £138.6 million lifetime cost for the May 2022 census. And the extension increased the lifetime cost of the census to £144.6 million. So th the extension added 4.3% to the cost of the census. And the final total cost of the census was? £144.6 million. Okay, thank you for that. Um, moving to the concept of lessons learned, which um, I think you will, you'll be aware of Syrian Diamond's evidence last week to that extent. And I think you yourself, to be fair, committed to that earlier in the chamber earlier this year. Um, I mean, not to revisit old ground, but the stark reality of Scotland's census is that it is approximately eight to nine percent behind uh, the rest of the UK's census in 2021. And in addition, certain areas of Scotland, Glasgow in particular, our biggest city, was you know, had a very low rate. Uh, in comparison to other areas of around about 81 per cent. Will you commit, when you uh, undertake the lessons learned exercise, to looking specifically at the disparity between Scotland and the rest of the UK, but also the disparity within Scotland, within local authority areas? Um, because I think that has, a, that has arisen this year and during the course of parliamentary scrutiny of this as I think a key issue. So yes, yes, and yes. And further to your point, I mean, I think it's entirely reasonable to, to ask why was there a variable rate of return between Scotland and the rest of the, of the UK? Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's a perfectly reasonable a question to try and get to the bottom of. But I would say equally, um, we should also be comparing our, our experience with elsewhere. Um, especially with the rest of the sort of industrialised uh, world where one can make especially social demographic comparisons to see where there are similarities and where there are differences. I think <clears throat> we're, not at the end of the, we're not at the end of the process yet in understanding the differences. I think it is unavoidable uh, to conclude, though, that the factor of people being in their houses because that's what they were during the pandemic, is a significant contributory factor to the ability of being able to reach people, particularly in, in, in more challenged social demographic um, uh, backgrounds, just in terms of an exercise, because I, I'm not sure if Mr. Cameron was one of the MSPs that went out and, and saw the, the census uh, collection. Was Mr. Cameron, did, you, 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 he wasn't able to see. Uh, the efforts that went into knock on doors again and again and again to try and reach people. And obviously, if you're not getting people in a lot, it's going to be difficult to try and get them to take part in a, in a, in a process. Uh, and so one might conclude, and it's a very unscientific conclusion, but I'm just drawing it as the non-statistician non and the, non, the, 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 the non-census um, uh, a professional um, is that you know that that there is definitely something in that, um, but to my mind that doesn't make me revisit uh, the question of whether the timing and the decision in Scotland was correct or not. I think the, the decision in Scotland, as it was in the majority of countries, to not go out and send thousands of people into communities to knock on doors to have face-to-face -face conversations with people at a time when we were telling them not to do that was the right response um, in Scotland. But, but to the point um, of Mr Cameron's uh, question, um, should we be trying to learn every lesson um, from uh, the experience in Scotland, in the rest of the UK and the rest of the world, especially countries with which we can compare ourselves best, Absolutely. And the reason why is, is that I think that we are dealing with a societal trend here. Uh, I don't think we are dealing with a specific moment in time. Um, if there is a specific moment in time, it may have been uh, in those countries where a, a census was being conducted during a lockdown. 
But for all the rest of us, uh, I think we're dealing with an ongoing uh, trend and we're going to have to work out, as we are in many other um, areas where we're trying to get information from people, uh, how we're able to do that where people don't want to or d don't trust or don't understand or don't have enough time, as they said, uh, was their reason for not taking part. Th thank you for those answers. Uh, um, uh, just to follow up on that a little, um, will you commit to publishing the lessons learnt document uh, for the benefit of the Parliament? Is that something you can commit to? Well, it's for, the, it's, it's for the NRS to make decisions as to what it is that they're going to be publishing, but I would want maximum transparency uh, so not only government minister, well, not only that NRS can understand what those might be, that government ministers understand them and that those who hold us to account do. Can you also so include, please, this is a point that was raised by Morris Golden, who's, who's not with us today, but he raised this last week about the um, impact of including what might be described as sensitive questions within the census. This was a really interesting point that was, he raised last week with mm. Sirian Diamond. But um, is that something that, that you could explore and um, uh, reflect upon? Look, I, I'm in favour of reflecting on everything. <laughs> um, I, but, I mean, in terms of that, I mean, one, one person's sensitive question is another person's less than sensitive question. Um, point one, what is a sensitive question? Um, but, but point two, if I, if I go back to the, the, the statistical response that we had when we actually asked people what were the reasons for not taking part in things, I think, um, I'm not wanting to repeat myself at length, um, uh, people's concerns about certain types of questions came in at less than 5% as a main contributory factor to them taking part or not taking part in the census. So does that mean that one shouldn't think about that? No, well, of course one should think. I mean, frankly, we need to think about everything. Um, but by the very nature of what a census is supposed to provide in terms of understanding society in the 21st century, there are a wide range of questions um, that are, are asked to understand the kind of country that we're in. I'll leave it to the statisticians to uh, go through the range of, um, of the types of questions that those are. The census now is a, a, a million miles away from where the census was uh, 20 or 100 years ago, and that's because we require much more information to provide the public services, amongst other things, uh, that we wish to provide in a way that is reflective of society, which is why we have to uh, ask the, the broadest range of questions. But, I mean, to the, the central point, should we be prepared to think about all kinds of questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Finally, um, can I ask a question um, about a letter that has been supplied to the committee from Mark Pont, who is the um, assessment programme lead with the Office for Statistics Regulation, and it's a letter, I think, to, to, to Mr Whitehouse, so you may want to bring him in, uh, where he makes a point about transparency. Uh, and he says um, he considers it would be in NRS's interest to be more transparent now about the steps that it is taking to generate good quality um, census estimates. We consider that being transparent about the various current activities, plans, processes, etc., would assure users of NRS's trustworthiness and reassure users that they can confidently expect high quality estimates from the census. Do you accept that? Yes, we do accept that being transparent is absolutely fundamental to what we're trying to do. And that's why um, I think in that letter, in the earlier bit of it, um, welcomed the fact that we have been transparent and we work very closely with Office of Statistical Regulation and take their advice, take their support. And Mark has written to me, as, you, as you've said, saying this would be a good time to do a little bit more on the evolution of your methodology. To that end, we have published our paper that's on our website that says, and it very much aligns with what you heard from the professors a couple of weeks ago about how we're building into this administrative data solution with more statistical and estimation methodology and we're learning from our colleagues in the UK but also very importantly around the world. Uh, the, the, if, if I may, there was a couple of other points that I just wanted to come back on. Um, we will be publishing for Parliament a review of the census. That is something that is there and it will happen in 2024. We are doing reviews of each element of those programmes and all of that will feed into that report about where we are. Um, the Professor Martin, in his contribution a couple of weeks ago, and Sir Ian, 
spoke about variation being something that is there across all censuses. So I think Professor Martin talked about areas of England and I think maybe affluent areas where people were considered to have left the area to go and live in a second home or somewhere out of the city and concerns about what that means. So we work and we have a conference coming up with our colleagues across the globe, so the International Census Forum, which brings in America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, ourselves in the UK and our four nations. We come together to learn from each other because we are we're facing into the same issues, which is, as the Cabinet Secretary says, how do you get people to respond in 2021, 2022, 2031, wherever it is, to things in a way that they're kind of increasingly not wishing to do. And that's where we get the stats there, we get the methodologies, we get the admin data. And the last point, if I could make, and it, sorry, it's just a factual thing, because it has been mentioned, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Glasgow's response was, was just under a sort of the 85, so it's 83 point uh, something. I can't remember the act detail, but it's not 81, it was 83 plus. Thank you for that correction. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ruskell? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm wondering if at this stage there are particular lessons to be learned about those hard to count groups. So, you know, more transient populations, um, students, for example, those with English as a second language, uh, those in particular types of housing. Um, and just, you know, reflecting on what you said earlier, Cabinet Secretary, about, you know, the marketing, there was a lot of marketing went out there. Um, it, it, is that sort of marketing targeted at those particular types of groups and, and what kind of lessons could be learned about how that could be improved going forward? Um, <clears throat> so the answer is yes. Um, and uh, is there still more that can be done? Uh, absolutely. Um, that there will have to be a full toolkit of ways in which one can reach um, different uh, parts of society, uh, I think is just a reflection of the fact that we are, uh, we are living in an ever more atomized society. Um, uh, what I am pleased though is if the one looks at the different ways in which support was offered, support for people who had English as a second language and some needed translation, support for people who, uh, for whom their eyesight wasn't, um, uh, wasn't good, that they could uh, complete the, the, the census on the phone um, with somebody helping them through it. Um, that uh, those people who preferred to do things in written form as opposed to doing things online could have a written census form, that people were given it when there were doorstep uh, visits when it was suggested that they prefer doing it with, with paper, but not losing sight of the fact, and you know, it is quite important that we don't lose sight of this, which is the extremely high rate in which there was a digital return of the census. This is the first time that this was um, prioritised in the way that it was uh, this time round. We are a society in flux where uh, younger people are absolutely at home using digital access to, to services uh, and um, you know the 9 in 10 return rate um, digitally shows that people were uh, content to do that. Um, but what we were having to do this time around was recognise that there are still people for whom that is not uh, their natural or preferred way to take part in the likes of a census, which is why there were then these additional range of ways in which people were able to, um, uh, to take part. Uh, but in terms of um, um, the likes of students and, and other uh, particular groups, I mean, I, I would be interested to know as part of the process which is still ongoing, um, uh, about how effective were the sort of internal communications, say, for example, in the, in the university or college landscape, um, or within certain faith communities where there might be a higher percentage of linguistic minor minorities uh, and so on. There definitely are going to be uh, lessons that one can learn from that. What, what worked particularly well and what does one need to do more on? I don't know if my NRS colleagues have got anything to add on any early impressions that we have from, from all of that. Um, I mean, my, my immediate reaction is that all of the logical 
processes that you would put in place, um, working with groups who can work on behalf of the census so that they can go into their communities, talk about benefits, talk about the importance of being part of it, talk about the safety of the census, the security, the data, and the purpose of it. All of those happens. Whether we can do more of them, that's a, a, a question, but also you know, the activities of all of the kind of engagement, as you would imagine and, and would have expected, we, I don't feel we left any stone unturned here. I think in terms of all of the work that we did to learn from how do you get to people, help them, support them with translations, with um, opportunities to phone in a help center and give your response online talking very, very heavily about the benefits to our nation, the benefits to our society, our communities, all the way down to the individual neighbourhoods. We really emphasised all of that, and, and yet in certain areas it, it obviously has not resonated as well as we would have hoped. But the, the question from a statistical perspective now is how do you maximize engagement to get that vast amount of data and then know what do you do if things if you if we in the future as is happening across the globe continue to have those challenges and so what are the as uh, the professor spoke about it what is that third pillar and how do you make mm. that as equal part in terms of our understanding i think nationally and societally that that is what a modern census mm. is i mean the world is changing and uh, you know you showed us earlier the impressive stack of written communication um, I, I did when I was out canvassing earlier in the year see quite a lot of that communication reminders and leaflets just kind of drifting around stairwells next to pizza delivery menus as well unfortunately um, and election literature I, I was put through the door but um, but yes I mean I, I, I'm interested to know you know particularly when you look at tools social media you know was there a campaign on youtube on tiktok yes. on yes. instagram yes. And, and what was the effectiveness of that were there different types of messages because what i i saw a lot on terrestrial tv was very community-minded messages about planning for education in schools absolutely appeals to myself but you know there's maybe different types of messages for different types of groups particularly people who are not permanent residents in communities and maybe moving on after a year or two. It, if it's helpful to the, the, uh, the committee, absolutely happy to provide um, uh, the background on the different types of messaging that were used across different platforms from television through to social media and it was full spectrum communication and it was aimed at different, um, different target audiences. Uh, I don't need to tell Mr. Ruskell a great detail. This obviously the, um, uh, the 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 audience that would be using TikTok is quite different from an audience that uses Facebook, which is quite different from an audience that um, will be watching certain television channels. That will be quite different from um, uh, uh, other types of of audience. And it's just a reflection of the time in which we live. Is that one has to communicate across all of these platforms and more. Um, and uh, no doubt the conclusion is going to be that we're going to have to do more of that um, the next time the census uh, comes around. But more than that, and this is a point that, that Paul Lowe was saying earlier, and I think this is really important because the lessons we're learning from this, I think, are not unique to the census. They are reflective of a societal trend and a challenge for anybody that is wanting to collect public information, information about the public, to help provide the best public services in the case of the census, or understanding the labour market, or understanding any other number of things about society at different stages. How can we do this in a way that it is then as genuinely reflective of the whole of society? And this is a point that I know that Sarah Boyack has spoken about uh, before, and she's right to highlight this. Um, so that um, because of variable rates of return, in shorthand, the more affluent an area, the higher the turnout, the lower the income uh, demographic, uh, the lower the rate of the return, and I'm, I'm very much simplifying, uh, but it is one of the most significant uh, factors. We have to make sure that we have mechanisms in place so that 
uh, the conclusions of whether in this case the census or in, in, um, uh, for other statistical uh, uh, products, there are methods in place that mean that you have a reflective, a genuinely reflective final census or survey. And that's where uh, I think it's really important, and I, 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 you know, I've got no reason to disbelieve that the committee uh, doesn't understand this, that the, what happens in terms of the, the, the work that takes place after the census, um, that we have the, uh, the survey work, which I think I'm right in saying, I'm looking at my NRS colleagues here before I overclaim here, I think is the biggest survey in Scotland after the census. Uh, and we're talking about um, the best part of a return of 30,000. It's you know between 25,000 and 30. I'm literally I, this is off the top of my head now. I think I'm, I think it is off that order. Um, and as people on the committee would know, that a normal statistical representative uh, survey normally is at about a thousand. So you're talking about an exercise which is 25 to 30 times the size of that. These are really significant efforts that. Are, are being undertaken to try and make sure that one is getting targeted information. Sorry, I should have stressed the point that this is targeted mm -hmm. within yep. those harder to reach parts of the, the return from the census to make sure that the overall picture, not only amongst other things, provides um, uh, the, the, the statistical certainty uh, of population numbers, which you're confident about, um, but also provides that level of granular detail about different communities and different pe people of different backgrounds and different communities so that when we are trying to provide public services, whether that's health or education or any other number of important public services, it is done so on the basis of reflective, high quality data. And I'm confident and my NRS colleagues are confident that that has been achieved in the 2022 census. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Allen. Thank you. Um, you alluded to this uh, a little, um, and uh, certainly something that we brought up in, in previous uh, sessions, but um, in reaching a decision to, to delay, was, was part of that uh, decision looking at um, how historically abnormal uh, a census taking place during a pandemic would have been? Uh, was, that, was that part of your consideration? Uh, I, it, it's difficult to think other than a war of more abnormal circumstances. Well, I, uh, Dr. Allen used the, the word you, so I, I wasn't part of the decision, so it's very difficult for me to think my way use. into my, my use, to use the Scots form, uh, for which Dr. Allen is very well qualified uh, to deploy. I'd need to, I'd need to turn to my NRS colleagues uh, who were part of that decision-making uh, uh, process. He Paul Lewis put, his, put his, his real as well as his virtual hand up um, to, 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 to answer that. So, I mean, I, it's not for me to second guess. I mean, the rationale t to me, just reading through things, is exactly the same rationale that led to nearly 60% of other countries in the same circumstance to come to the same conclusion. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it to, to Paul Lowe to, to take us through things as he was actually there and, and part of the process itself. Okay, Mr. Lowe. Thank, thank, thank you, convener. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary and Dr. Allen. Yeah, there, there were a number of factors that, were, that informed our decision making, Dr. Allen, but certainly the, the point you raised, and, and I believe we talked about it a bit in June as well, you know, was a relevant factor. The census is, is about taking a, a snapshot in time, but it's also about taking a representative snapshot in time, which can then be used in subsequent years. We were using 2011 census data, for example, in some of our analysis around COVID and the impact of COVID on, on people from different populations and, and different ethnicities, uh, you know, some years later. So it's that, that ability to use it in a range of ways, sometimes not anticipated, um, that, that's really important. So. The, uh, as I think um, Professor Rian Diamond said to the committee um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there isn't an algorithm here to make a decision about whether you went in 2021 or you went later. But 71% of countries in the world went later because of COVID. And uh, a significant proportion that did then run it made changes to their census, including ONS uh, and NISRA colleagues who, uh, who made some changes to their census. But one of the challenges is that the census gathers lots of important information about a range of things. Where are students? Where are they studying? Where are they placed? Where are people working? How do they get to work? Where do they live? And the, the pandemic introduced some really um, short term but significant shifts in society. People were not uh, necessarily 
um, commuting to work. Students were at home, not in their place of study. Um, so there's a range of data that's that's effectively skewed by the circumstances of a pandemic. Now the challenge that the, the organizations who took censuses during the pandemic are having to face into and have faced into is how do you make then adjustments to that census data to uh, take into account the fact that society wasn't in the right place. So you'll have been aware of um, local authorities in London boroughs, you know, expressing concern about uh, undercounts of population in the census because it was taken in a pandemic and a lot of people didn't <laughs> didn't end up staying in their usual places in London as an example. So 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 there wasn't any one right or wrong answer. There was an approach and then there were things that had to be managed as a consequence of consequence of that. Um, ONS were also very mindful that if they were to delay their census, picking up on Mr. Cameron's point earlier on finance, that it would have cost them 365 million to delay a year or nearly 39% of their program budget of nearly a billion pounds. Um, obviously, we were able to do that at an additional cost, and I appreciate that, but it was 18% and 21.6 million to do that and to gather that data. And I certainly think the data we've gathered in Scotland in March 2022 is probably reflective of how Scottish society looks like and will look like over the next few years. Uh, so, you know, hopefully that helps. Thank you, Kenuda. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mintel. Thank you, Convener, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for coming and um, the team as well. Um, I was struck when you were talking about the way and the different ways you could um, get information out to people about the census. Um, I studied statistics for one year when I was at secondary school, and I have to admit, um, I, it wasn't my favourite subject. Um, but last night, um, uh, Sarah Boyack and myself attended the... Uh, culture and communities um, cross-party group and there was a, an exceptionally interesting presentation at that by um, the leader of Dundee University's archive and how they have opened their archive out to um, school children, different ages of people to share stories about the past um, and quoted, and I haven't got the exact quote, but a quote from Nelson Mandela in 2005, archives are also about making the future. So I'm following on from um, Mr. Cameron's questions. I'm interested to hear about how this is something that you could perhaps be doing to um, emphasize to people like me, whose statistics isn't my favorite subject, that actually the importance of this and the lessons that we can learn. We got an example of a woman who was suffering from mental health um, issues, and she went back to the archives um, of one of the hospitals in Dundee. And from that, they've, they've learned from that. They've done a play. They've taken it out to the communities. She's been on various different medias. So I'm just wondering if there's stories like that that might help tell the positive story of the census and, as a result, get through whichever one of the three pillars, we get better results. So, um, first off, um, convener, if you don't mind me correcting the record, my last answer, I talked about 60 plus percent of um, uh, countries uh, delaying uh, their census. Um, it was 59 countries. It was 71 percent of countries um, delayed um, from the census um, period. Um, to um, Ginny Minto's point about storytelling in the sense of communicating more effectively, I think undoubtedly that has to be part of the solution. I mean, in effect, that is what was happening. I don't know if um, all committee members actually saw the television adverts um, that, that involved, um, I, I thought, really imaginative ways of communicating why this, the, the connection between taking part in the census and this providing a local hospital or other form of public service. And so, you know, the, these efforts were being undertaken to try and help explain why this um, was not an abstract exercise. It was something that was really going to matter uh, to all of us. Can, can one do that better? Well, undoubtedly. And in 10 years' time, who knows what Scotland will be like? And 
um, uh, well, I have some hopes about uh, how it will be in, in 10 years' time. Um, uh, I see Donald Cameron smiling in agreement. Good. Um, well, we're making progress. Uh, sorry, I'm being a bit cheeky there. Um, and, um, but, I mean, I, I think the trends that we are trying to understand here, I think, are going to continue in, in terms of the changing nature of society and the fact that we are going to have to be imaginative in being able to reach out in different ways to different people in different places and not expect to have the same impact or rate of return on things. Um, and uh, I'm sure that colleagues here, and I think it was really important to hear that our, our NRS colleagues here are part of international networks that work with colleagues, um, especially in comparable countries, but, but further than that as well, uh, to try and learn what others are doing as well. I don't think that there's a silver bullet in any of this. I don't think that there is something that was um, uh, uh, missed uh, that would have made a significant statistical uh, difference. Uh, I think that the, the, the lengthening of the collection period was really, really important uh, to helping reach those places where, notwithstanding, um, uh, the extensive communication work that had taken place, that there just clearly needed to be more and different and direct. Um, and uh, we, we will have to calibrate that in, in the best possible way for, uh, for the next census. Um, but I think there is something in, in Jenny Minto's point about schools, which is something that I was speaking about with officials, um, in fact, before the, uh, the evidence session, uh, here and um, it's good that, that, that there were efforts undertaken in the run-up to this but I think if you can imagine kids going to school um, and understanding what the census is and why that's important and then going home and then being able to help explain um, and ask parents about um, the census and um, you know, when are we doing it, um, uh, and, and all of that. I think that's quite an important part of um, uh, the, uh, the equation. So education, I think, is, is, is a part of that, and I think we need an imaginative um, response. Um, it is being done already, as are all of these other things, but can, uh, can these things um, be reviewed and better understood mm -hmm. and their effectiveness be... Um, um, uh, be assured, uh, yes, and I think it's just constant improvement. It's going to is is, but that's what my, the, the colleagues at NRS do already. They, it's all about doing a job, learning the lessons, reviewing it, uh, implementing the the changes that need to take place, um, publish what they're doing. You know, I, you know, I'm all for hearing people saying that they're wanting transparency and things. Well, you know, please go to the NRS website and, <laughs> and have a look uh, and what there is there. Uh, have a look at the documentation that is, has been provided. It is extensive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I haven't said it already, but I'd, I'd like to put on, on record my appreciation of the really hard work that went into uh, Census 22 from NRS and, by extension, everybody else that took part in the process to the enumerators, to the people in the call centre and, and so on, because there was an extraordinary, extraordinary effort that went in to making sure that we could get to the stage that we're at now, which is to have high quality data that will mean that census 2022 that some people were casting doubt on, let us not forget this, including in the parliamentary chamber here. Um, it is just factually incorrect um, to suggest that uh, census 22 will not be providing high quality data. It is, it will, um, and uh, it has delivered. It is having to deliver in a different way to previous censuses, and I think um, I think that trend will continue. And I, I think you know, all lessons that need to be learned have to be learned, and no doubt we will come back to this committee convener um, to report on on what those are. But you know, the, my my colleagues here are you know extremely intellectually curious. They want to know what uh, uh, what has to change and how to do it, and um, I, I think countries elsewhere in the world are looking to Scotland to better understand this phenomenon because they realise that they are dealing with the same or similar phenomena as we are. And you cannot get much further away geographically in the world than New Zealand. And they too are speaking with colleagues here 
about the experience here to try and make sure that they can maximise their uh, return rate. Um, and they have settled on a number which is remarkably similar to the return rate that, um, that we secured here in Scotland. Thank you. I think that exhausts questions from the committee this morning, Cabinet Secretary. And I thank you and your officials um, for their attendance at committee this morning. Um, we're now moving into private session for a further agenda item. Thank Good you. Stuff. Thank you very much.